I'm Jim Dunham. I'm the director of special projects at the Booth Western Art Museum in Cartersville, Georgia, and I'm president of the Wild West History Association. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Wyatt Earp and the making of the movie Tombstone. Wyatt Earp was was a fascinating character in the Old West, and his story that he uh, takes place in Tombstone that culminates with the gunfight and the street fight that became known as the gunfight at O.K. Corral, followed by the Vendetta Ride, uh, in which he, he took on uh, Curly Bill and the Clantons, and, and uh, that entire story is one of the great narratives of the American West. And they have been making movies uh, about it a long time, beginning in 1931, uh, just years after Wyatt Earp died, they, they made Law and Order uh, with Walter Houston playing the Wyatt Earp character and Harry Carey Sr. playing the Doc Holliday character. And it's been kind of a buddy film that uh, has been done on quite a number of occasions. Uh, Law and Order was followed by Frontier uh, uh, Justice and, and, uh, and, and uh, Frontier Lawmen. And of course, they, they did several, even, even uh, Ronald Reagan was involved in, in playing a Wyatt Earp character. And uh, probably the more famous Western movie that deals with Wyatt Earp is My Darling Clementine, in which Henry Fonda played in John Ford's wonderful film. The actual uh, history of My Darling Clementine was very, very loose-knit. It was not uh, the true story of what really happened. In fact, Peter Bogdanovich, uh, who of course was a great director himself and did the last picture show, he interviewed uh, John Ford one time and he said to John Ford, he said, you said you knew Wyatt Earp and Wyatt Earp told you the story of the OK Corral. Why didn't you put that in your movie? And uh, John Ford said, did you like the movie? And uh, Von Donovich said, yes, I, I did, but it, it, uh, it wasn't accurate. Why didn't you put what Wyatt Earp said and uh, put it in the movie? And of course, John Ford said, did you like the movie? <laughs> and Peter Von Donovich said, yes, I did. And movie people and the industry, the film industry has always put the production and the and the story uh, as the important thing and not historical accuracy. Actually, the the first time we start to see that people really care about authentic uh, things going into movies is really the movie Tombstone. And uh, <clears throat> although there have been movies where they had good costuming, the movie Arizona, and which was done in 1940, has great costuming. And, uh, but, the, but this is really the first time the Wyatt Earp story is told in more accuracy. And it's interesting because the original idea back in, in uh, 1993, in that period, time period, to do something about Wyatt Earp was really Kevin Costner's idea. Kevin Costner wanted to do a three-part miniseries like Lonesome Dove based upon the life of Wyatt Earp. And he went to a... Uh, uh, TV writer, Dan Gordon, and he said, I want you to do a three-part series. I'm going to do two hours of Wyatt Earp from his birth in Monmouth, Illinois, throughout his early life with his pet family, and we'll have Nicholas Serp, his father, will be involved. Take that right up until when he gets married uh, to his first wife, and uh, he becomes a, a, a peace officer in Lamar, Missouri. Then part two will be his years as a buffalo hunter, and as a Kansas lawman, and uh, takes him through in, in his final days in Dodge City, and his friendship with Bat Masterson, his, his uh, knowing and meeting Doc Holliday. And then part three, the, the last two hours, will be the tombstone years, and then going to uh, Alaska and, and uh, getting involved in owning the Dexter Saloon in Nome, Alaska. That was the original plan. Dan Gordon wrote the script and turned it in. Kevin Costner did not like it. And it was not the writing, it didn't have power in the writing. And so he kind of abandoned the idea. And right about the same time that this was all happening, right about that same time, Western historian Jeff Morey was uh, having, uh, he met with, with Kevin Jarr. Kevin Jarr had written uh, the movie Glory and, uh, and they were sharing ideas and having dinner together. And, and uh, 
And Jeff said, uh, he said, you're, you're thinking of making a Western. And Kevin Jarre said, yeah, I think maybe I will. I want to do something about Wild Bill Hickok. I've always liked Wild Bill Hickok. For one thing, he was just an absolutely interesting guy, shoulder length hair, and he, and he, had, he wore a red sash, and he carried his guns butt forward in a red sash, and then he has this, this fabulous career. And Jeff said, well, you know, the guy who really hasn't had the best movie made about him is Wyatt Earp. Of course, that's partly because Jeff is a, a Wyatt Earp historian and, and uh, loved Wyatt Earp and still does. And, uh, and so Kevin Jarr said, well, maybe we should take a look at Wyatt Earp and you consider Wyatt Earp as a possibility. And, uh, and so he began to do some research and they did uh, uh, a number of, of uh, books, got a number of books, read a number of books. And, and uh, Jeff and, and uh, Kevin Jarr said, all right, let's take a trip to Arizona. And so they took a trip to, to Phoenix and they went to the Guidon bookstore and, uh, and Kevin said, well, let's buy whatever books we need. The chef says, you don't, you don't know what you're, what you're saying. I could, I could easily spend $50,000 on books in this, in this building because that was the best bookstore on Western history in the world. And, uh, and so, but they didn't spend that kind of money, but they did buy a lot of books about, about Wyatt Earp. I mean, there, there's, for all the way back to, to 1883, there's been books about Wyatt Earp. The first one was W.H. Bishop's book, uh, Old Mexico and Their Lost Provinces. It actually, in 1883, has a story about the gunfight at O.K. Corral, stories about the Earps and the Clantons, and even has a nice line drawing of, of a uh, Arizona sheriff in, in Tombstone, Arizona. So they, they went from there and they, uh, stayed at a, at a hotel there and we're, they were having breakfast and, and uh, Jeff said, I want you to meet Jim Dunham. And so I met them for breakfast and we spent about three hours just sitting at the, at the table in that hotel talking about why Wyatt Earp would make a good movie. And, uh, and Kevin Jarre said to me, he said, uh, tell me why you, you think Wyatt Earp would make a good movie. And I said, one, I said, one thing that would make, uh, make a good movie as I said, there's there's five good women's roles in this story. I mean, every one of these guys is married. You know, Wyatt's married to, to Maddie Blaylock, and, uh, and and these guys, you know, Virgil is, is married to Allie, and, uh, and and Morgan's married to Louisa, and, and Doc, of course, has, has Kate. And uh, <clears throat> so all these guys have wives, and then, of course, you, you have the presence uh, later on of Josephine Marcus, who comes along, and and even though she's connected romantically with John Bean, eventually uh, Wyatt and, and Josephine will get together and be together for nearly 50 years as husband and wife. So I said, if you develop these women's roles and flesh them out and write a script in which those become important parts of the story, I said, I can't guarantee that the, that the movie will be better because of that, but I'll tell you what, if you do it, you can get financing because there will be people in Hollywood who would be glad to finance a movie that has good women, a Western movie that has good parts for women. I know that people will want to put money in it. And then he started talking to Jeff and said to Jeff, he said, why do you think that, that Wyatt Earp liked Doc Holliday? And uh, Jeff thought about it for a minute and he says, I think that Doc Holliday made him laugh. He says, that's going in the movie. <laughs> and, of course, and of course, he did find a way to put that into the script and became part of the movie. Another thing that, that Jeff said, because Jeff had given uh, Kevin Jarr one of the more important books to read. And of course, the, the, the two real important books about White Earth that were early, around 1927 and 1931, were, were Walter Noble Burns' book, uh, Tombstone, uh, Iliad of the Southwest and and uh, Stuart N. Lake's book Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshall, and so and so these two books really were they were the two books that really made Wyatt Earp famous. Wyatt Earp was not as famous as Billy the Kid, Jesse James, and some of these other people in their own in his own lifetime. Now there were people who knew about him. There were certainly stories in the, in the newspapers, but Wyatt Earp actually received more press and more coverage in the, in the press because of his decision in the Sharky Fitzsimmons boxing match 
at the Mechanics Plaza in San Francisco, uh, close to the turn of the century, that that was a problem in which Wyatt Earp as referee, what Wyatt Earp as referee had stopped the fight in the eighth round, given the, the fight to uh, Sharkey, saying that Bob Fitzsimmons hit him with a low blow. And he stopped the fight and gave it to Sharkey. Well, Thomas Sharkey was not the favorite. Bob Fitzsimmons was the favorite. And so, and so uh, uh, money, a lot of money was lost because they had been bet on Bob Fitzsimmons. Wyatt, Wyatt Earp was accused of, of throwing the fight. And that, and that story, one of the people who lost money was one of the editors of the San Francisco newspaper that, that was the most popular newspaper. And he wrote all kinds of terrible things about Wyatt Earp being a crook and taking bribes and throwing the fight. And uh, we don't know for sure. Wyatt Earp was not squeaky clean and he wasn't beyond stuff like that. But uh, it seems to me if you're gonna throw a fight, you don't wait to lay grounds uh, to see if your guy's gonna, gonna get knocked out or not. But anyway, uh, the Sharky Fitzsimmons fight produced a lot of press and a lot of newspaper. And, and the gunfight of okay, Corral, or the street fight of Tombstone, which is how it was referred to in the newspaper stories at the time, did get some coverage, but nothing at all uh, like the later stuff. So Wyatt was not famous until the two books came out, the, the book uh, that Walter Noble Burns wrote and the work, book that Stuart Lake wrote. There was also a book that was the first negative book about Wyatt Earp, and that was Held Dorado by Billy Breckenridge. Billy Breckenridge was a deputy to Sheriff Johnny Bean, and, and Billy Breckenridge writes a negative Wyatt Earp. He doesn't like Wyatt Earp, and in 1928, he writes a negative Wyatt Earp book. So those three books really were the first books that captured the imagination. Stuart Lake especially took off like gangbusters and, and his book became a bestseller. And it was his book that produced so many of the movies. Uh, the credit for uh, My Darling Clementine is given to Stuart Lake. And of course, uh, Gunfight at the Okay Corral. And definitely the television series with, with Hugh O'Brien. In fact, Stuart Lake worked as an advisor for the television series, uh, The Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp with Hugh O'Brien. And so, so the, the, these books is what established the fame of Wyatt Earp. And Jeff Mooring gave the book by Walter Noble Burns to uh, Kevin Jarre to read and get ideas of what he wanted to do. In that book, he has Doc Holliday say to Johnny Ringo, I'm your Huckleberry, that's just my game. And so Doc, Doc Holliday said that in the book. Whether he ever said it in real life, probably not. But at the time, in th this was written in the 1920s, the, the use of the word Huckleberry was definitely used in a way that, uh, hey, that's cool, man. I'm, I'm, I'm your man. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who can handle that. It, it, I'm, I'm a Huckleberry. I'm, I'm capable to the, to meet the effort and to, and to be the guy. And so, a lot. In fact, there were articles in some of the newspapers in Los Angeles, San Francisco, saying the term Huckleberry is being overused. The way some people said the term cool was being overused. Everything is cool. Hey, man, it's cool. And then the young people were using it and overusing it. And Huckleberry was kind of the same thing in the 1920s. And so uh, Kevin Jarr said, okay, we're gonna put that in the movie because that's, that's a good line, even though it was, it was created by Walter Noble Burns. And that, and that line went into all the scripts. And, and, uh, and there are people who say that, that, that the actual meaning of the line is, is Huckleberry because that was a, a term for the handles on a coffin, but that's not true. The, the term goes right back to Walter Noble Burns' book, Huckleberry, that it was Huckleberry then, and it was Huckleberry in all versions of the script. And so Kevin Jarr was a great fan of the films of John Ford. And the films of John Ford have great presence and they look beautiful. In the films of John Ford, John Ford loved to establish a big shot where uh, John Wayne and his characters that were in his movie would be talking and visiting, but included in the shot would be the horses tied to the hitching rail and the Navajo dogs would go around and, and, and the horses would be jumping around because the dogs were bothering them. John Ford said, keep shooting, keep shooting. Don't stop because I want that to be included. 
and and uh, he liked that that atmosphere, that presence. In fact, uh, uh, when Winton Hope was filming uh, my uh, the uh, uh, she wore a yellow ribbon, it started to rain, and the soldiers were walking their horses, and the clouds got all dark, and there was lightning, and it was raining, and and uh, the cinematographer said to John Ford, "We need to we need to shut down. We need to cut." the film and shut down because we're losing the light. And John Ford said, no, no, keep filming, keep filming. Then they filmed that entire march of the horses and the cavalrymen in the rain with these great black clouds and the great lightning going on. Guess what? Because of that scene, he won the Academy Award for Best Cinematography that year. And of course, uh, John Ford knew what he was doing. The problem with John Ford movies, though, is they don't translate to modern times. They don't translate well to television. You watch a, a movie like Stagecoach or uh, some of the some of the uh, uh, military films like uh, Apache, uh, Fort Apache, or or My Darling Clementine, or any of those films. Uh, she wore a yellow ribbon. You watch them on television, and because the screen is so small. The people are very small, and you can't see them see them much, and they're way in the distance, and you're frustrated because it's not the way modern movies look. What what Kevin Jar brought to that beginning of the film was number one, the best writing that had been done in years. Absolutely wonderful language, the use of language, his understanding of the Victorian era in language was a lot like uh, the the writer of True Grit, of Portis's writing. True Grit has that wonderful use of language that is appropriate for that time period. And that's what Kevin Jar brought. And he had, he had a great storytelling ability. That's what he did when he wrote the movie Glory. He just, he told the story so well. And because he loved history, and because he knew history, and because he knew the Old West, he was able to establish the best costumes, the best look, they, they made the best sets. They, you know, they used old Tucson to some extent, but then they also uh, went to Mescal and they took that, that Mescal Western movie set and they rebuilt it to be Tombstone. They went to the trouble of actually taking photographs of Tombstone, images of Tombstone, and recreating the exact stores, shops, saloons that were actually in 1880 that were in Tombstone. Mescal and the sets in Mescal, when they started to shoot, had a visual and a look like nothing else. They were people who who made movies were, were uh, saying to to people that's not what it should look like. It should be dirty and look look old. And Kevin Jar said, No, no, we're just, the, the, the the town has just been built. They just discovered Shefflin just found silver in the mines. They they didn't have a town there uh, two years ago. They're now they're building this town in in 1878, 1879, and 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 so when Wyatt Earp arrives. There's still construction going on. They're going from tents to, to adobe. They're going from tents to, to false fronts. And they're getting brand new paint. These, are, these buildings are just freshly painted. And uh, it's so funny because so many people who made Westerns thought that everything should be brown, everything should be old, everything should be worn out. And uh, Kevin Jar was so intelligent in knowing that everything looked, needed to look new and fresh. He also knew that in the Victorian era, People who, who were in cities and towns did not dress like, like they were farmers and cowboys. They dressed in suits and ties. And so he puts the herbs and he puts John Bean and he puts the people who are, who are going to be the principals that are going to be townspeople dressed in a period, period clothing the, the way they would have looked in, back in the historical times. It's not, if you're willing to do it, it's not hard to do the research because if you do the research, you can, you can see that many photographs were taken of those guys. And in fact, even the cowboys, the cowboys that they were coming up the trails of the cowboys that worked on ranches. I mean, when they came to town, they, they didn't roll up their sleeves. They didn't take off their, their vests. They didn't, they didn't, they wore ties. They wore ties, they, wore, they, they didn't open their neck. And, uh, and there was a look about them that was, that was a, a look that normally you don't see in movies. Kevin Jar brought that presence and that look to the movie. He had worked a deal. He, 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 had, he, had, he had arranged for the right to direct. Kevin Jar originally tried to, to put, do his script with Universal. And when, when 
Kevin Costner found out that there was a movie going to be made about Wyatt Earp, he came running to Universal and he said, wait, I have, I have a Wyatt Earp script first. But his, of course, was a three-part miniseries for television. It was, it was six hours. And so he went to Kasman and he said, uh, let's, let's make it a feature. Let's condense it and let's put it together. Let's make it a, a two or three hour feature. And they, they rewrote the thing, they got it ready, and they went back to, to Universal. And Universal backed away and decided that they weren't going to agree to make the, the movie Tombstone with, Kirk, with uh, Kevin Jarr. So Kevin Jarr turned around and found that Disney was more interested and Synergy was more interested. And he got permission for a, a movie that would be a $25 million movie and let him direct. Now he had never directed a movie before. But because of the quality of his writing and because of the quality of his storytelling, they said, you can direct. And so Kevin Jarr was able to establish the actors. And he hired the, the actors, he hired uh, all of the principals. He arranged for all of the cowboys and the extras. And uh, he got Peter Shereko, who, who knew the what kind of saddles were supposed to be. And he knew all of the cowboys and put together that group of people who would be the, the band of the cowboys. And, uh, and, and, and it literally was put together with, with just the best, some of the very best actors and, and some of the very best uh, knowledge of, of Westerns. A lot of people read that script and said, I want to be in that movie. You know, Sam Elliott and, and uh, uh, Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer and, and, and uh, uh, Bill Paxton. Those guys came to it because of the writing. They knew that this was going to be absolutely terrific writing. And they knew it was good writing. They knew they they did not know how good a, a director Kevin Jar would be, but they knew that the potential for this story was great. And then they had a great appreciation for the background because of the, the sets and because of the of the costumes and because of, I mean all the hats were wonderful. They they, they 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 looked great. So they started filming. And when they started filming, uh, they they uh, they became frustrated. Because what they found was that that uh, Kevin Jarr, for all of his skill as a writer, did not know how to place the camera to get the best images. And because he liked John Ford, he wanted to do all of these establishing shots, which the, the actors are in the distance, and there's all this stuff going on, and you don't have any close-ups. Well, I'll tell you what, modern day movies are, are all about close-ups. And, uh, and they became frustrated. The actors became frustrated. And, uh, and they, they began to get restless, and they began to complain. And, uh, and William Fraker, who, who was the cinematographer, talked to Kevin Jarr, and he says, Kevin, he says, let me help you. Let me show you how to place the camera. Let me show you how, what we need to do. And Kevin just would not, he thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he had the right control. He thought his, 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 that his, his idea was good, and he wouldn't take any advice. And uh, Fraker had had, uh, had filmed Monty Walsh. He had he had ex he had experience as a director, and uh, and and yet he wouldn't listen to him. And uh, Kurt Russell tried to help him. Kurt Russell tried to try to say, you know, we need to we need to have different kinds of shots. We need to have close-ups. We need to get in there and have close-ups. Well, he they wouldn't he wouldn't do it. And it became very, very difficult. All of, all of the actors began to get restless. They knew that this wasn't working. As good as the script was, the movie was absolutely collapsing that summer of, of 1993 while they were trying to film, trying to get ahead of the fact that they knew that uh, uh, that Kevin Costner was at the same time trying to make his wider movie. They definitely wanted to get theirs finished and get it in the can and get it out. And uh, literally, the actors eventually went to Synergy, they went to Disney, and they said, we just need a new director. We have to have a new director. And they fired uh, Kevin Jarr. Now, Kevin Jarr had received, you know, a good amount of money for the script. He had been told how much money he was going to get as a director, so they had to buy him out of his, his situation. So he made a lot of money. And he did, of course, keep his name on the on the film as the writer of the film. But they brought in George Cosmatos as the director. And Cosmatos is the guy who did Rambo movies. 
And, and, and what's so interesting is that as soon as Cosmatos got on the set, and he was a, he was a loud, uh, vulgar man, with, he would swear all the time, and he was noisy and he yelled at people, and, uh, but he knew how to place the camera to get the best action shots. So it's such an interesting combination because if Kevin Jar had not been fired and they had made the movie that Kevin Jar wanted, all of the historians would love the movie and say this is the most historically accurate movie about Wyatt Earp. And it really has a great look, has great uh, uh, actors playing the part, and it really, but it's slow, doesn't move well, isn't paced well, doesn't have any close-ups, and it's kind of boring. And, that, and it would not have made money. The movie that Kevin Jar would have made would have, would have been satisfying to historians and would not have made money. On the other hand, if, if all of those things hadn't been already settled, the costumes, the actors, the locations, when Cosmatos comes along, if, the, if Cosmatos had been in there from the very beginning, he would have wrecked the things that we love, the historical things. First thing he did when he got there, he, says, he said, it's not green enough, it needs to be green. And so he says, we need, we need to move the location. And they said, George, if we're filming it where it really took place. This is the deserts of Arizona. This is where the gunfight happened. He says, yeah, but we need more green. We need to have trees and grass. And they said, no, no, we're not moving. We're going to do it here. And then he, the cowboys showed up and he said, what are all those cowboys doing on my movie? Get them out of here. They're all fired. And they said, no, 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 no. Get to that. These are the bad guys. He says, why are they wearing those red sashes? Get them to take those sashes off. He said, no, 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 no. That, that's, that's to show that they're part of the of the cowboy gang, of the outlaws. Those are your bad guys. And he says, oh, okay, well then they can stay. <laughs> so he, he was a crazy guy. And he would have, he would have wrecked it. He, would, he wanted the movie to be Rambo. He wanted it to be Rambo goes west and kills everybody. And so, so if Cosmos had had a free hand and not been, been, been forced to work with the, with the sets, the costumes and the actors, the horses and all that stuff, uh, it, it would have been it would have been a wreck movie. It, it, but at the same time, he knew how to bring the camera in and fill the screen with somebody's face. And as a result, he began to work with Val Kilmer, and Kurt Russell helped him because Kurt Kurt took control. He said, "This is how we need to shoot this shot. This is the next shot we need. This is what we need." And and the combination of Kurt Russell. Loving this movie so much, loving the, the story so much, loving the script so much, and not letting it be wrecked, controlling the situation, working with George Cosmatos so that he saved the movie from being just turned into a silly action movie and hang, hung on to the things that we love and kept the things we love. The combination meant a movie that was going to work. It was going to have history, it was going to have authentic costumes. It was going to have good actors, it was going to have good storytelling, but it was still going to have excitement. It was going to have action, and it was going to have excitement, and it was going to have close-ups. It was going to translate well to television. I remember when, when I met with Kevin Jar, Kevin Jar said, do you want to be in the movie? I said, well, yeah, of course I want to be in the movie. And he said, you're going to have to read for a part. And I said, well, I'll, I'll do that. I've got, I've got background in acting, and I'll, I'll read for a part. And so I went down to the casting people in, in Tucson and I read for a part and I, I got a part called the, the High Roller. It had three scenes in the movie. One of them was with Val Kilmer and uh, one of them was with Kurt Russell. And, and there, were, there were three scenes in the film and they figured that it would take at least uh, three or four days to do it. And I signed a Screen Actors Go contract for $450 a day for those scenes. And, uh, and so, they started filming and then and then I got a phone call from my friend Jeff Morey. He says, Jeff, Kevin Jar got fired. So I called I called the production people and I said, I understand that Kevin Jar got fired. They said, yes, and we have a new director, George Cosmatos. I said, well, am I still in the movie? Because because it was Kevin Jar who opened the door for me to, to be a have a part. And they said, well, we need to find out and get back to you. So they called me back and, then, and a day later and they said, we've talked to George. George says, you're still in the movie. Your character is called the minor, but you're still in the movie. And I said, well, that's great. And I said, now, when I signed a contract, I told him, I said, every, every day all summer is, is open. I don't have any problem, with the exception of the last Saturday of July through the first Saturday of August. I'm in Logan, Utah, for the Festival of the American West, which I've done every year for a dozen years. 
and I have a contract to, to perform in that show. And so we were living in, in uh, Tempe, Arizona, and that the time came, they said, no trouble, we, we, won't, we won't be filming your part until weeks after you get back. I said, good. So the day came to go to Utah, and I got in my car, drove to Utah, and of course this was before cell phones, so when I got to, to Logan, I, I went to a pay phone, called home, and I told my wife I had safely arrived, a safe trip, and she said, the movie people have been trying all day to reach you. I said, that doesn't sound good at all. I called the, the movie people, and they said, You're, they, they're going to film your scenes tomorrow. I said, I'm in Utah. I can't, I can't be there tomorrow, and I've got a contract to, to be in, in Utah. And they, they said, well, we understand, and it's not your fault. Well, I knew it wasn't my fault. And they said, but we're going to still film because George wants to film it tomorrow, so we're going to replace you, and you won't be doing it. But because it's not your fault, because you have a Screen Actors Guild contract, you'll get paid. So I think what happened was when they went to put the credits in the film, they looked at who got paid, because anybody who got paid is in the movie. And so they saw that I was paid, and so if you watch the movie Tombstone and you see the credits, you'll see that I'm listed as an actor, as the, as the minor. And of course, I never got paid, but I still get residuals. So the result is a film which is one of the most popular films of Westerns that we've had in many recent years because of the combination of what Kevin Jar brought to it in history and understanding the period, understanding the costumes, understanding who great actors were, and, and George Cosmatos, and understanding how action and close-ups play an important part in modern-day filmmaking, making the movie Tombstone one of the most unique Western films in modern times. I'm Jim Dunham, and uh, I'm the president of Wild West History and we hope that you enjoy and you you become a member of WWHA at a soon soon as you can. Thank you for, for listening. Adios.